good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy, and I'm the co-chair of the YSIC Committee and a partner of all partnership. Uh, what we're going to do now in this panel is to discuss cryptocurrencies, blockchain, NFTs. Now, as all of you know, not a day goes by where we don't see some news in the papers about cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and NFTs. And indeed, we're seeing companies, financial institutions, et cetera, having, uh, increasingly adopting blockchain technology. And there is also increasing acceptance of crypto assets as an alternative asset class. Now, what in this panel we want to discuss is what this all means for an arbitration practitioner. Are these new developments any relevant? Should we be concerned about them? And if so, what should we look out for given that we're dealing with a relatively new uh, area of development? And we're very happy to have with us today four speakers who are very well versed in this space and they'll be able to discuss with us some of these issues and share with us their insights. Our first speaker is Kelvin Koo. Uh, he, Kelvin is a New York and Hong Kong qualified, dual qualified cross-border litigator at Cobra and Kim. He's based in Hong Kong. He focuses his practice on all stages of claim monetization, including digital asset tracing and recovery, as well as creative award enforcement strategies. He also represents blockchain companies and government enforcement investigations. Our next speaker is Matthew uh, McGee from 20SX. Matthew is a commercial barrister at 20SX in London. He has acted in English and Singapore cases concerning cryptocurrency, which also feature in his book published last year titled A Practical Guide to Cyber Fraud Litigation. And I'm making a note to myself that I need to buy a copy of this book. Our, our first speaker is Rakesh, and he is a director and um, chief technology officer of Drew and Napier LLC. He specializes in commercial dispute resolution and litigation, and also advises on cyber and digital business issues, including cloud computing contracts, as well as compliance with technology regulations and cybersecurity. Rakesh has substantial experience in dealing with issues concerning technology and electronic evidence. And with his legal and technical knowledge, he manages to simplify these issues for judges and arbitrators alike. And finally, last but not least, we have Andy Mihan, uh, as our fourth speaker, Andy is currently the Chief Compliance Officer and Head of Legal for Gemini Trust Company, APEC, based here in Singapore. Gemini is a regulated cryptocurrency exchange and custody service that was founded by Cameron and Tyler Winkerboss in 2014 and currently has offices in the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, and Singapore. Before moving into the cryptocurrency industry, Andy served as in-house counsel for Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse in Hong Kong. And prior to that, he was a litigator in Cobra and Kim in Hong Kong. I understand he interviewed Calvin and A Kingdom in New York. Now let's get into the session proper. And I want Rakesh uh, to start us off. Um, and Rakesh, can you just help us demystify some of these terms that we've been banding about cryptocurrency, blockchain, NFTs. Uh, can you also explain to us you know, what are we talking about when we talk about cryptocurrency, NFTs, blockchain disputes? Are these disputes really that different from the other type of commercial disputes we've been handling? Thanks, Wendy. Um, so just before I begin, I'd just like to say thanks very much to the YSIC Committee for, for the invitation. It's a very exciting time to be alive. Uh, there's certainly new things happening all over the world. And, and you're spot on when you said that you wake up every day to new crypto and NFT news. Um, and, you know, um, one of the things that I'm a little bit disappointed about is that when you wake up and you see uh, cryptocurrency and NFT news, that's usually all you see. Everyone forgets about blockchain, which is really the engine that underlies all of this. Um, what I'll do is I will start off by maybe just speaking about five very common terms that are banded about every day. And a lot of people read about them. They don't quite understand what it means until they Google it. Um, so the five terms are blockchain, hashing, cryptocurrency, NFT, and smart contracts. These are the five terms I'm going to just quickly touch on. So what, what, what do we mean when we refer to blockchain, which is the thing that I'm most disappointed uh, about, isn't referred to enough? Um, as the name suggests, it's really a chain of blocks of data. Okay, that's, that's the, it, so it's not a bunch of bricks together. It is, uh, it's data. It's intangible. Um, and the unique thing about blockchain is that um, every block is verified against the previous block. 
And what that means from a technological perspective is that you have a very high degree of assurance about the data uh, in the entire chain. As new data is added, you have to verify that data against the, uh, the algorithms, the security mechanisms, against the blocks and the, and, and the previous blocks in the chain. And so ultimately, the idea is that you have a secure, incorruptible um, ledger of data, which can be information, which can be functionality that um, enables the user to, well, to use for everyday purposes. Um, so it, it's a very interesting uh, uh, concept, of course. Uh, one of the great functionalities that has come out of blockchain is um, cryptocurrency and is NFTs. Uh, let me just talk a bit about hashing. Um, and I like to refer to hashing as like the glue which holds the blockchain together. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because if you did not have hashing, uh, you wouldn't be able to verify uh, the data in each of the previous blocks. Um, so what is a hash? It's basically a security mechanism. That, that's what it is. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's how technology creates a security code, if you will, from known data. So for example, um, if I say uh, Calvin gave Matthew 10 Bitcoin, right? Uh, that's five words and maybe a, a, say 30 characters. Your hash could be uh, five words and 30 characters. And so the next block that gets added to the chain, we'll check to make sure that the previous block had five words and 30 characters. And maybe in the next block that comes on, the hash will be different and it needs to be verified. So when you have a hashing function, you make sure that the chain um, is verified across uh, each block and it remains secure. I'm obviously oversimplifying it, but the idea is to make it simple for, for people to understand. So in a way, um, hashing it, it's not just unique to blockchain. Uh, it works in encrypted uh, uh, contracts and encrypted uh, email signatures as well. It's not a unique function, but it is, in a sense, vital to how blockchain works. So the next term is obviously cryptocurrency, which is really the buzz. Everybody wakes up and then Elon Musk says something about Bitcoin and Twitter and it loses half its value, right? And then the next day it regains twice the value. It's quite an incredible uh, asset class. And of course, it's gaining um, acceptance in more and more places around the world. Um, so what is cryptocurrency? In a sense, it is a type of currency or token that is stored on the blockchain. Uh, that's, the, again, an oversimplified way of thinking about it. Um, but cryptocurrency, of course, we all know about Ether. We all know about Bitcoin. Uh, the best way to maybe compare cryptocurrency is against um, NFTs, which I'll refer to next, non-fungible tokens. Now, cryptocurrency, despite their name, actually doesn't have any inherent value in itself, right? It's really the value that the world ascribes to it, hence uh, the volatility of the asset. Um, you could say the same about regular currency and fiat, right? What's that backed by? Um, but the difference, I suppose, is that, you know, with fiat, you have centralized institutions and regulatory authorities, elected governments uh, that play a part in regulating a regular fiat. In cryptocurrency, it's a little bit of a free-for-all, but checked, in a sense, by the blockchain system to make sure that um, uh, there is no one can hack in and steal uh, the limited number of Bitcoin, limited number of Ether that may exist on, on the blockchain. Um, so when you say cryptocurrency disputes, a lot of people get, oh, it's, it's, it's like, you know, Bitcoin's $50,000 now. So obviously, a lot of people are going to be fighting over it. And as all litigators and, and arbitration practitioners know, where there's money involved, there's a fight to be had. So it's, it's, uh, it's really the next big thing in terms of asset classes. Um, there are many differing views over whether it's a good asset class or a bad asset class. You know, should you be the last person holding it? What is the difference between that kind of asset class and say um, the shares in the next IPO? Non-fungible tokens um, is a really, uh, I think, more functional use of blockchain. So cryptocurrency obviously is a popular use because it involves money. Um, but non-fungible tokens are, it's a very, very, very uh, practical and unique use of the blockchain system. So uh, in case you don't know, um, so a non-fungible token, as you always will know, fungibility just basically means you can replace one item with another and there won't be a difference. Right? So currency is your typical fungible item. You replace one $10 note with another $10 note, there's no difference, it's fungible. 
Um, a non-fungible token basically means that that token in the blockchain, it, you can't replace it with something else. It won't be the same anymore. And because it is non-fungible, it therefore has certain unique characteristics. Uh, to give you real life examples of NFT, I mean, I think the most popular ones right now are uh, NFTs in connection with uh, virtual art, right? Like people, uh, our virtual artists like people and others who have very, very successfully uh, captured the attention of various art fanatics and virtual art fanatics around the world who are willing to pay top dollar, right? For a, the rights or the exclusive rights uh, to be able to access a particular piece of, of uh, virtual or visual art. So other examples include, for example, in, in uh, the music world, uh, there have been various pop artists and bands like the Kings of Leon band that has uh, successfully, uh, uh, I think, launched an NFT that sells exclusive content accessible only through the NFT alongside its album. And then you have the National Basketball Association in the US also who is selling exclusive content using NFTs. And then the next thing, of course, would be um, a lot of people trade the NFTs. So you can have a bit of like a stock exchange for NFTs. And if you're a big enough fan of Adele and she's launched a new album uh, with NFT content, uh, the biggest fans tend to pay top dollar for that kind of content. So then you, the, the value that you ascribe to the token then increases based on supply and demand. Now, the last term I'll speak about is smart contracts, which is really from a litigation, from a, from a lawyer's perspective, is the biggest buzzword because we get excited when we see the word contract and we're like, oh yeah, you know, what's going on here? Um, at its core, my view on, on what a smart contract is, is, is that it's just computer code. Um, the simplest way of thinking of a smart contract um, is, is that it is code that executes certain functionality when reaching certain conditions or when certain conditions are met. Um, in, in, a, in a simple way to think about it, if this, then that. So if Bitcoin reaches 50,000, sell Bitcoin. That in a way is, you could say is a smart contract. And way tokens and blockchain kind of works is that if that condition is met, the condition tells the functionality to execute automatically. And then your Bitcoin is sold automatically upon Bitcoin reaching 50,000. Again, I'm over oversimplifying and there can be a number of conditions that you can um, customize and express in, in, the, in the smart contract on the blockchain. Um, now, a very interesting question that has come up is, are smart contracts legally binding contracts? Um, my own view is that at the, the starting point is that if it's computer code and you don't have offer acceptance and consideration, it's not really a legally binding contract. But you know, query whether you could express a smart contract um, as a legally binding contract. If you think about it, every corporate contract uh, drafted by lawyers out there is kind of code, right? Because you are catering for different outcomes. What happens if this happens? If there's a termination of the contract, what's the liquidated damages payable? So if this, then that. So that, that's um, a, a very key similarity between smart contracts and your regular legally drafted contracts. Uh, and, and I think it's an open question. I think ultimately you still got to satisfy the legal elements, but in theory, there's really no reason why a smart contract on a blockchain can't also constitute a legally binding contract if all the legal elements are met. Um, and then you asked another question about, you know, whether it's really different uh, from your usual disputes. And I think my short answer is that um, it's different only to the extent that the subject matter is different. Um, as the you know, society evolves, as we move along, as with any new subject area, um, the law needs to understand the facts of how that subject matter works and then tailor uh, its responses accordingly, uh, applying relevant legal principles, and in the rare occasion, making new legal principle because you know, the, the law just doesn't cater for that kind of fact. So, so a lot of people get excited by, oh, you know, it's a breach of the smart contract, you know, what I would say is consider whether or not that sentence makes sense. Are you, are you breaching a piece of computer code or are you actually breaching a, a legally defined agreement um, that may contain computer code or that may express computer code? Um, uh, just because you buy and sell NFTs or just because you buy and sell cryptocurrency based on certain conditions doesn't necessarily make it um, a cryptocurrency dispute. It could just be, it could be no different from buying and selling shares or a car 
um, or bonds. It's pretty much the same thing. Now, the one interesting thing about blockchains and cryptocurrencies and NFTs, um, the very nature of blockchain, uh, the idea that it is an incorruptible ledger and the functionality, uh, it, it works on, on uh, customized conditions, um, basically means that if you have a dispute between two parties who are on chain, so to speak, um, well, let me rephrase that. It's actually quite difficult to see how you can have a dispute between two parties on chain because the smart contract executes automatically when defined conditions are met. So theoretically, you can't have a choice. You can't have a choice to dispute um, uh, uh, a contract. You can't have a choice to breach your contract and say, I'm not going to, to do this because um, you've done something else to me. And I, and, I, and I don't think that you're entitled to the benefits of this contract that I've now agreed to you. Um, of course, you, you know, computers are imperfect and, and you might have a situation where uh, you, you have a mistake in the execution of the conditions of the algorithm. Uh, and that, I think, may give rise to what we call uh, a dispute. And if that dispute is on chain, that may call for uh, dispute resolution services on chain. Again, I think theoretically it'll, it'll be rare. It'll be interesting to see how that space develops. But most of the disputes that I've seen so far uh, they're really your, your, your standard commercial disputes um, or complex commercial disputes, but with a uh, blockchain or crypto element. Thanks, thanks Rakesh. Um, I, I should remind the audience that we are taking questions uh, from all of you and we want to make the session interact as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we will take them, the speakers and I will take them at the end of the session. Um, now, Rakesh has helpfully laid out and explained to us so that we're all on the same page as to what we're talking about. Um, he's also given his view that uh, perhaps, you know, that we're not really talking about cryptocurrency, NFT, blockchain disputes, but just any other type of disputes. Um, can I just turn to Andy, right? Andy, in, in, in your line of work, uh, in your experience, what uh, types of disputes uh, have you seen coming up in this space? Um, trends that you see coming up in the future? And I think, I, and when you're at it, uh, perhaps also let us know whether any of these disputes, you know, will actually be referred to arbitration, or as you know, Rakesh says, right? Um, there's no need, there's no dispute, nothing will come out of it. And so we don't no need for no jobs for arbitration practitioners. Sure. First off, thanks for having me, and it's um, uh, my family. Thanks you. I've put on a collared shirt for the first time in about eighteen months. I think is, I'm like. Uh, fancy lawyers, us uh, Bitcoin guys just wear t-shirts most of the day. Um, so this feels it feels itchy, but I'm I'm getting used to it again. Um, so I, Rakesh, I mean, took like a lot of what I have to say. I don't really have um, much to disagree with, but um, you know, maybe I can kind of walk through what we've seen in these early years, and it's still early years of, of Bitcoin and, and crypto and blockchain adoption um, and where that might be headed. So I think it's uh, I think it's certainly the case where we will see arbitrations involving disputes that involve cryptocurrency, blockchain, that kind of thing. As Rakesh said, the, the disputes that come up in this area are generally not that different than disputes that come up in most other industries. Uh, it just happens to have a different product underlying the different technology, but you still have investment contracts where um, either the terms of that contract weren't clear at the start or the, um, the investment into which uh, people that put money has taken on a completely different characteristic than what was initially intended. Uh, and many of those contracts were initially drafted with arbitration clauses and we'll hear you know, those disputes make it through uh, through the various stages. Um, but I think that outside of those areas of disputes that typically make their way into, into arbitration, whether it's investment contracts or service agreements or IP ownership rights, um, things that crypto shares in common with many other industries, I do think that there are um, the, the moment maybe has not arrived yet. But I think we'd be remiss to assume that despite the broad movement away from centralization and 
government controlled institutions that cryptocurrency and blockchain has kind of forged in the in the past 10 years won't have an impact on courts and arbitrations and dispute resolution within that industry. And you've already seen some different um, technologies arising and um, and blockchains being devised to decentralize arbitration, which I think is super interesting. Um, if people who are interested in just seeing kind of what that might look like, there's a coin out there called Kleros. It's not offered by Gemini. I don't have any interest in the coin, but I think it's something that's, it's an interesting project. It's an interesting experiment into whether the same kinds of phenomena that cause people to distrust governments and trust other people in a trustless system, uh, such as Bitcoin, would work in the area of dispute resolution. Like, can you resolve disputes in this space by what is effectively a majority rule kind of system? It sounds a little bit crazy, um, but like that already applies in a lot of things that we take for granted now. I mean, Wikipedia is effectively a trustless system that's controlled by majority rule. Whoever the most people think, you know, is the truth of the content on Wikipedia is what is the truth on the content on Wikipedia. And yet we refer to that all the time as the gospel. Uh, so, you know, I don't think it's that far fetched to think that people who believe that um, institutions in general shouldn't be trusted with important things like currency, maybe shouldn't be entrusted with important things like justice either. And that's kind of wild and, and our, you know, a little bit of an anarchist type uh, angle, but I'm not sure. I, look, this is such, it's such early years right now. It's really difficult to predict where this technology is going to take us or what technology is going to come out of this um, that we haven't even thought of yet. So, you know, as to where the disputes are going here, look, I have no idea. I don't think anyone can really fairly say that they do. Um, but for the next couple of years, there's some really interesting arbitrations that will be coming down the pipe to watch just to understand how people think about this in um, the system that we've kind of gotten used to this, uh, you know, where clear rules exist in arbitrations and courts and whatnot, whether disputes will continue to be resolved in that manner. I don't know. It'll be interesting. And I think, but I think it, this is like a fun topic for the young arbitrators here uh, because just like young bankers who think they're going to go into finance and it's going to be the same as it was 20, 30 years ago. Uh, that's crazy. And I'm not so sure the legal world is that much different. Well, Andy, given, given that um, you're saying that it's hard to predict what might come up in the future, I mean, what would you say to arbitration practitioners uh, who are keen to ensure that when these disputes come up, they're not left in the, you know, in the, in the cold, right? Because they don't know anything about this area and they wouldn't know how to deal with those disputes. I mean, what, what would you suggest, um, you know? Yeah, sure, should... well, I, yeah. I mean, I think for those that are interested in, in this space in general, there's lots of, um, you know, executive kind of courses you can take, books you can read, that sort of thing. But again, to the extent that you're arbitrating, in this space in traditional methods of, of arbitration dispute resolution. Like the important thing is to just be a well-rounded yeah. lawyer who can apply different types of scenarios and different types of factual backgrounds to the legal principles that you're already familiar with. I mean, that's, again, th there's not gonna be that much fundamentally different about the content of mm disputes that take place in the cryptocurrency blockchain world as they do in, you know, specialized medicine or nanotechnology or lots of other spaces where the, uh, unless you're a true expert in that field, it's all just gibberish and you have to kind of decipher yep. what the important facts are in this dispute from what is just really interesting technology or science or other background information that's not necessarily relevant to to your ability to act to to decide, um, you know how the dispute should should come out. Um, but then, that said, yes. I mean, I do think there's going to be 
this this space is still in its infancy in terms of how it's going to be applied to our daily lives. Like I, I would encourage anyone with an interest in um, you know what the future might look like ten years from now, five years from now, who knows, to explore this area because even if even if we're not still talking about Bitcoin in five years, I am quite confident we'll be talking about something that is based on the initial concepts of blockchain or Bitcoin or however you want to you know think of that as an industry right now. Yeah, I think that's that, that's good advice. I think first point, um, let's all not freak out when we see a cryptocurrency, blockchain, uh, NFT type dispute, something we can pick up and learn. And second, start start dabbling in it, perhaps start getting involved, start reading about it. If, if you are interested, maybe start creating some of these things yourself. Um, Kelvin and Matthew, I just wanted to turn to you about this comment that Rakesh had earlier about whether smart contracts are really contracts and whether they can be breached um, and and, and things like that. I mean, your thoughts on it? Yes, so uh, thanks very much. And I'll, I'll echo what um, Andy and Rakesh said at the start. Thank you very much to YASIAC to, uh, for inviting us all to speak. So I think my view on the smart contract point is an interesting, um, it's an interesting area because people don't always use the words to mean the same thing. Uh, and this really goes back to what Rakesh was saying right at the very start, which is that all of these terms get used, but we do have to be quite careful about what we're talking about when we when we do actually use them. So uh, smart contracts in the true sense, which I think Rakesh was referring to, is where the only document is effectively a set of computer coding saying in these circumstances, this is what happens as a consequence. And it's all completely auto-executing, auto it runs itself. Often though, you have what I might call a, a soft smart contract or a pseudo smart contract, where there's a more traditional written contract in words, which the parties have agreed, and they've effectively bolted on some smart elements to it. So they might have a, um, a very basic example, there could be a written contract for the sale of some um, goods, and there's a smart element bolted on where the money, the, the purchase price is paid in advance to a third party escrow account. And that money gets released automatically on certain things happening. For example, some sort of token being passed between the parties. So there you have a hybrid contract um, where there is plainly some traditional written element, which we can have a normal dispute about. And there's also the auto executing element. Um, so that clearly is a contract. The, the more interesting question is going back to Rakesh's point about where you have a purely um, coded contract, a sort of pure smart contract. And there, uh, it's obviously right that you can't withhold performance because it is all automatic. But uh, this is an interesting area because there's not really been any determination as to whether a smart contract is actually a legal contract. But from the English law perspective, we've had um, the UK Jurisdiction Task Force for a few years now. It's not a, a state body in any way, so it's, it's not a, an authoritative view on the law, but it, it is very well known, respected practitioners giving their views. And they have said that there's nothing in principle to say that a smart contract is not a legally binding contract under English law. All it means is that you're not going to get the whole range of disputes, you're not going to get situations where parties are refusing to perform and there's an arbitration trying to get them to perform. But what you could have is a situation where effectively something has gone wrong with the computer coding and you've got some unexpected result. So you could still have uh, traditional legal disputes in the new smart contract world um, relating to things such as um, mistake or misrepresentation. And uh, in, in that sense, one of the, I think, earliest cryptocurrency cases um, or cases with a crypto element was in Singapore in the B2C2 and, and coin case. And that I can see is where the sort of smart contract dispute could lie, because in that instance, there was automatic trading um, on crypto and there was effectively an error in the coding somewhere, which meant that there was some trading going on at hugely um, disadvantageous prices. And the question was, are the parties bound by the trading that did take place or can it be effectively revoked? And that is very traditional ideas about um, mistake in, in contracts and what the parties intended and, uh, and should be taken to have intended. 
so that's my view on, on the smart contract side. I, I don't know whether, um, Calvin, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think, uh, again, uh, thanks everyone for the, the invitation. Happy to join from Hong Kong. I think uh, Matthew and, and Rakesh and Andy covered that. I think maybe just to put one final point on, on everyone's comments is, and from a practical perspective, last week, uh, I attended uh, what we call here in Hong Kong FinTech Week. And not only was it a lot of blockchain uh, companies attending, but now the government was helping host it and a lot of traditional banks were there. And I flagged that to say, you know, kind of consistent with what Andy was saying, that certainly in the next few years, um, I think we're going to see, you know, traditional types of disputes arising, just given the players, right? You have these big banks that are going to be probably keen on more traditional ways of dispute resolution. Over time, that will change. Uh, smart contract development will be very fascinating to watch. I definitely think that's something to look into. And all the questions that Rakesh and Matthew pointed out will be fascinating. But in the short, medium term, I think, as everyone's saying, it, it, we're still sort of in a, in a more traditional space. Yep. It's just a new product. Yep, you're right. I, I, I think I think exactly right. It's fascinating. You know, it could be something going on with the coding. It could be that you know something popped up or something cropped up that nobody actually thought about and nobody actually wrote any code for. I mean, in that situation, what sort of uh, legal rights can you possibly have, and what can you actually do about it? That's all um, interesting issues for us to mull over. Um, Matt. I know we've covered quite a fair bit about how maybe don't, you know, cryptocurrency, blockchain, NFT disputes are not that different from other types of disputes. Um, but in your experience, is there anything that you know practitioners should look out for in particular if they're dealing with issues, uh, disputes that actually concern cryptocurrency, you know, blockchain and the like? Yes, yeah, so I've I've touched on one point, which is the smart contracts point what is their status and that is a uh, i suppose an open question the other question which was very popular um, but we seem to be reaching a bit of a consensus on is what is the status of of crypto assets themselves are they um, legal property are they some sort of contractual right a security right or or something entirely new that we, we've not really grappled with before and uh, i think that is still obviously a live issue that has not been conclusively determined, uh, but lots of jurisdictions, particularly um, the common law jurisdictions, seem to be quite comfortable in the view that these are a special species of property, but we deal with them just as, as any other um, asset, any other um, item of property. So there's not, a, I suppose, a special issue there, but I think that's a live point that we just need to keep in the back of our minds that that is not completely settled. But I, I suppose what we really need to do is tease apart um, what we're thinking about in terms of specific crypto assets. Um, what are we actually thinking about? How do they differ from each other? And also teasing apart any specific item of property, any specific asset, and anything that's associated with that asset, which you might be tempted to think of as all rolled into one package. So to give a couple of examples, um, we've spoken about cryptocurrency and NFTs. Um, those are two different types of crypto asset, but how much actually are, are they conceptually different? Um, perhaps not all that much. But uh, when uh, we look at the example of um, NFTs and what I suppose might be packaged with them, we can then separate that out into actually different rights. So uh, if you have an NFT which has certain um, rights uh, a license to use uh, or access certain products what you might end up with is you're thinking you're buying one nft product which um, is the nft and all the rights with it but actually you might own the nft that might be a piece of property but you might separately have a set of contractual rights and, and you have to make sure you deal with those distinctly and in the correct way for each of them and uh, I was thinking you could even go one step further. Uh, when we look at traditional assets, one of the uh, ones which we're most concerned about sometimes with uh, the likes of money laundering is artwork, very expensive artwork, um, very popular, very portable, very saleable. There is an issue there with provenance, and that could be fixed with having NFTs associated with specific artworks. So what you end up doing is when you go and buy a beautiful painting, you also buy the NFT saying this is the sort of certificate of authenticity, effectively. And you know 
that the artwork is genuine and you know that you're buying it from a legitimate seller. But there, what you've got is you've got the artwork that you're buying and the NFT that you're buying, and they are conceptually different things. Um, so it's important, I really think, really to pull apart what it is that you're, you're transacting and what you're doing in that sense. Uh, and uh, so I, I suppose one other observation, just almost following on from the uh, the, the possible property status of, of crypto, which I think does seem to be fairly settled. It's fairly settled in the context often of protective injunctions. So for arbitration practitioners, um, we're often thinking, well, uh, not just about getting our dispute settled, but how do we make sure that we protect the, the wider position, including for enforcement later? Um, freezing injunctions or getting um, protective orders from the tribunal are very popular for that sort of thing. But uh, there is an additional element to be concerned about with crypto, uh, which partly arises from the volatility of the assets. So uh, I've certainly seen examples where people have got freezing injunctions in support of claims, but the freezing injunction specifically excludes any crypto assets of that individual. And that's because if you have a freezing injunction, which does cover the crypto assets, if they hugely um, appreciate in value and the person whose assets they are and who has them frozen says, well, I would have sold them at that hugely increased price and it's now crashed again, you as the claimant could end up paying them an awful lot of money as compensation for having incorrectly frozen their assets. Um, so, so there's definitely an issue there. That's on if you go for a freezing injunction situation. You can also look at what sort of orders you could get from a tribunal. So the tribunal themselves have orders to uh, to direct custody of property and, and um, the application of property, including at an interim stage. And, and that, I think, would be a, a, it's been very broadly defined in England and in Singapore. So you would be able to cover crypto with that. But query whether you want to, again, for the same risk of exposing yourself to uh, potential liabilities. And there's also a, an issue that, well, how do you take control or custody of the crypto asset in the sense that if all you need is a private key to move the asset from one place to another, it's no good simply giving a copy of the private key to the tribunal to take care of because the person with the asset still has the private key, they could still use it. So what you need to do is actually move the asset entirely out of their control. But the question is then who's going to take custody of that? Is there going to be an insurance ramification? Because you're not going to want the tribunal, for example, sitting there with millions of dollars worth of crypto assets pending the outcome of an arbitration. So there's these sorts of practical issues that we need to work through as well. Uh, Matthew, you mentioned uh, earlier that it's fairly settled that cryptocurrency is property. Um, did you think that same analysis applies to NFTs? I think probably yes. Uh, I don't think it's been tested so far as I'm aware at all. Normally we're dealing with you know, freezing orders over Bitcoin and that sort of thing. But I would have thought that exactly the same logic that applies to crypto also applies to NFTs because it, the, the logic of saying that crypto is is an item of property, cryptocurrency is an item of property, is all based around um, the fact that it is unique property, it is very carefully defined, it's capable of exclusive control. And all of those same arguments can apply to an NFT. So um, although we treat them as different um, products at, at a commercial scale, we see them as being slightly different things. Ultimately, there's there's not a huge difference between the matter at a conceptual level. Um, you've talked about injunctions and um, them possibly extending to cryptocurrency. And that immediately brought to my mind, what happens if the defendant does not actually disclose um, his ownership of cryptocurrency or, or NFTs you know, because he is seeking to evade enforcement at the end of the day? Um, and, and that's a question that I want to pose to Kelvin. I mean, Kelvin, um, as, as we've said, right, um, crypto assets, it's increasingly uh, a viable alternative asset class. People are increasingly owning cryptocurrency and NFTs. And, and therefore, one, not, one needs to start thinking about how, um, about looking into or identifying these assets when you are seeking to enforce an award against award debtors. Uh, can you perhaps just talk us through what 
uh, you know, how it all works, enforcing an award against cryptocurrency and NFTs, both in terms of identifying where the asset is and then taking the actual step of enforcing against those assets. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and I think maybe just to step back a half step um, and to re reiterate sort of the theme we've had in this panel is that um, there are lots of strategies and tools and approaches which have applied in sort of, if I can use lack of a better term, you know, the traditional non-crypto world, which you can also use in this enforcement space, but you have to know how to utilize those tools in particular circumstances in this space. And I, and I know that we have a question from Alvin that sort of hit the nail on the head of, of sort of the practical matter. So I will get to that. Um, but, you know, just as in the traditional world, there's a possibility if you're sitting on an, a, an award, you may face a, a recalcitrant adversary, a, a recalcitrant award debtor who's not cooperating with the award. And, and maybe they have a complex network of shell companies and, and asset holdings in various jurisdictions. So just as you have to navigate that world uh, in a, in a you know, strategic way, so too in the crypto world. So you know, with, uh, with good asset intelligence, and Wendy, you sort of put, put this, uh, flag this in your question, if you do your diligence up front and really dive in and figure out if you expect to have a difficult adversary on the enforcement perspective and you figure out where the assets are, and I'll get to how you find crypto assets, um, and you know where the different you know, jurisdictional exposure points, some places are more creditor friendly than others, you can really start to map out at least a general strategy that you can deploy when, when the time comes. Um, and again, some of, the, some of the tools may be more traditional. Um, look for bank accounts. You know, a few years ago when I first got involved in the crypto and blockchain space, a lot of, you know, some of my blockchain technology clients had difficulty getting, you know, traditional bank accounts because the traditional banks didn't want to service them. It's a whole new world now, right? And just, like I said a minute ago at the fintech conference, the traditional banks were there. Um, so having a bank account, the adversary having a bank account, a traditional bank account, that's a traditional way of you know, maybe going after some assets to uh, recover from. Um, they may have client relationships and accounts receivables that you can go after. Again, sort of a traditional route. And the other aspect that you can pursue is, um, you know, a lot of these are people that can concerned about their reputation or the long-term viability of their business. So with appropriate you know, leverage and strategy pushing back on that, you can perhaps get them to come to the negotiation table and resolve this issue without a, you know, a decades long freeze and seize campaign, which probably no one really wants to deal with in, in a long enforcement. But to get to sort of the crypto rub on this, um, can you actually trace and track and freeze assets on the blockchain? Obviously classic lawyer answer, it depends, but yes, it, it's, it's not as difficult and in some cases easier um, than what some people outside of the space think. You know, as we've said, it's all on the blockchain. It's all public, every transaction is there on a public blockchain, it's immutable. So, you know, taking an extreme, if there were only a couple of transactions of a digital asset, you can see every hand, again, maybe it's a pseudo, pseudo, pseudo anonymous, I can never pronounce that word, uh, wallet, but you can see where it has been and you can see where it is now, right? For more complex transactions, meaning maybe as a function of time, there's multiple transactions and maybe a cryptocurrency, different, it gets exchanged to, to another cryptocurrency and then moved in different amounts. Um, it is helpful to utilize uh, or work with professionals who have access to you know, top of class software, which can crunch all of this data very quickly and show you the path. And, it, and it's really remarkable what you can do with some of these applications. You can click on the different wallets uh, the, over the course of the transaction, including where it is right now, and it will tell you potentially whether that wallet is associated with a particular exchange, for example. And if you know that, you might be able to approach that exchange and ask them for KYC or disclosure information, obviously meeting certain thresholds that are needed for that exchange to work with you on that. Um, you may, be able, may even be able to find out who's behind that wallet because in past cases, or you know, sometimes there's investigations or other uh, uh, public disclosures, that name will be revealed. Um, so it's a really powerful tool and in some ways, even better than a traditional world. You know, when I do traditional asset recovery, trying to follow fiat currency, 
have to go to the court, get an, a disclosure order, serve that on the bank. The bank takes a few weeks to get me a bank statement. I have to review the bank statement to see what the inflows and outflows are, and then do it over and over again. And I'm you know months behind where the asset is. In cryptocurrency, you can be just minutes behind. You can see that those transactions in real time. So it, it's definitely possible to trace. It's you can definitely use tools to try and you know sort of do detective work and figure out who's behind those wallets. Doesn't work every time, but it's there. Uh, and then once you have that information, you can, as others have said, um, go back to using traditional tools of further disclosure orders, freezing orders, et cetera, in relevant jurisdictions. Definitely the common law jurisdictions are very helpful in this regard. Uh, and then um, if, there's, if you're lucky enough to have an exchange or some other third party provider in the middle that's willing to listen to court orders, you can serve them and they can freeze it in, in the right circumstances. So there, there's plenty of tools to use to, uh, to try and pursue this enforcement. And then sort of the last point on this, and this goes to Alvin's question uh, in the Q&A, um, what if you get that full on extreme where the person or the, the adversary is completely not cooperative? And what if it's a situation where um, the equivalent value isn't what you're trying to recover, right? So, you, so some of those other strategies trying to cover equivalent dollar amounts or whatever isn't what you want. You need the actual thing, which maybe is the NFT scenario because that's not fungible. Um, yes, ultimately you probably need those private keys and access to those private keys to affect that actual transfer. Um, it's obviously not a situation where, you know, you can have a sheriff, you know, beat down a door and seize, physically seize a Picasso painting. But what you can do is try and find a way to get personal liability, especially if you can criminal liability on the person. And that just ramps up the pressure on that individual to comply and turn over those keys. So for example, if you had an order, some sort of turnover order for that NFT, right? Uh, and the person doesn't comply, well, then that person might be in contempt of court, criminal sanctions, uh, and then you have the ability to put that criminal pressure on the person. And you know, a lot of times that will bring a person to the table to comply. And uh, even if it's not the person, if they've done something where, you know, a lot of times when we do recovery cases, we look out for fraudulent transfers and other exposure points. Sometimes you have these debtors that like to have a tight circle of friends. And as soon as they transfer to their friends or family, um, they might think themselves invincible because of where they are, or who they are. But once those friends and family get involved and you have a claim of fraud or conspiracy and you put the pressure on them, then that also may bring the person to the negotiation table. So these are different techniques um, that we like to employ to try and, and bring people uh, to the table if you can't actually agree to yeah. getting that traditional turnover. What, what if you're not actually able to locate the award debtor? So after the award comes out, you know, he or she loses or it loses, and you know, if it's a person, right? If the person disappears and you're not able to locate him or her so as to put this sort of pressure on him or his, his family. What, yeah, what would so, you recommend at, you know, for, for, for that situation? Um, I mean, I guess a couple of things. I would say before getting into the enforcement procedure and perhaps even before getting involved in the arbitration itself, you do need to think carefully about that. Right. Yeah, there are some tools and things you could do, which I can describe in a second. But, you know, obviously your chances of success are lower than in a normal situation. So do you want to spend the time and money and effort uh, going through the arbitration? And then, there's, of course, the risks of a default judgment. Or is that going to get recognized when you're trying to uh, serve it in some other jurisdiction, for example, if you need to, because the other side never appeared? Um, uh, and then are you actually going to be able to successfully recover it? So you need to build that into your strategy. Don't get so blinded by sort of the pure legal aspect of it uh, and, and just go down a very linear path only to find at the end that you can't recover it. So obviously give some thought at the beginning to how this is going to play out. Um, but all that being said, uh, you may not know the person, but there's other tools. Sometimes a government might know more. Um, especially if there's elements of fraud or, or it's sort of the shadowy networks, we've definitely interfaced with government agencies who, you know, obviously it wouldn't be public, but they're doing these investigations sometimes into the dark web and they have all these links and information that they might be able to uh, figure out who you're, you're dealing with. So um, that's one, one route to that. Um, there's other strategies where if you can, if, even if you don't know the specific individual, if you know their network, you can still employ some of those 
tools and techniques and, and leverage points to put pressure on them. And with the view that that is eventually going to go back to the ultimate decision maker and, and you can might affect some recovery that way, but definitely give some thought to all the strategy before, you know, the end of the day and you realize you don't have a, a high chance of recovery. Thank you. And um, let's turn to some of the questions that we have uh, from the audience. And uh, this question, I think either maybe Rakesh or Matthew or both of you, uh, because it arises out of your discussion earlier on smart contracts. Um, and it's from MT, in the legal contract governing a business scheme, ut scheme utilizing smart contracts, um, is it possible to agree to restrict the scope of claims and or evidence in order to reduce the possible cost of legal disputes? In this context, is it different between, is it different from dispute resolution in court and arbitration? So I guess I'll I'll, I'll take it and, and maybe Andy can can uh, can uh, close it off. But essentially, the question is it, really quite a traditional question. Um, can you restrict the scope of claims and or evidence? Well, contractually, you can try and limit your liability. You can try and uh, if you can, you have an arbitration clause. Um, it's completely up to the parties what falls within the scope of the arbitration, because as we all know, uh, in, in arbitration, consent is jurisdiction. So um, the, the short answer is it, it, it really will turn on your negotiating power. Um, there's obviously a difference between dispute resolution in court and arbitration, um, and that's a very traditional issue. Uh, with, with arbitration, it's, uh, it's consensual, it's private. Uh, I will say the one advantage of maybe having an arbitration clause uh, is that uh, maybe because we have a finite number of judges, especially in Singapore, who are tech savvy. But if you, because we have so many arbitrators on the panel, and particularly at SIAC and, and other, other jurisdictions and other institutions, um, you might uh, be able to find an arbitrator uh, who is more tech savvy, more familiar, more au fait with the, the way blockchain and smart contracts work. Uh, and it's just better, you know, it's just better to have someone with some expertise at the subject matter hearing the dispute um, so that, and I, I don't know, forgive the term, but they can call BS if you know what I mean, right? If you, you can't smoke them, there's no mirrors there. Um, yeah. So they'll know what they're talking about. Um, and since I had the, the table for a while, uh, just to touch a little bit on, on Calvin's point earlier about, you know, doing your due diligence, um, I wanted to just uh, drop this for everyone in, in case they don't know, uh, you know, just kind of baby steps 101 blockchain. Um, Google Etherscan, right? E-T-H-E-R-S-C-A. Just Google Etherscan. Uh, check it out. It, it basically shows you um, a, a whole bunch of Ethereum wallets out there, people who have cryptocurrencies, uh, not just Ether, but other cryptocurrencies. And you can, you know, just take a click around. It's all public. And you can see um, how these things work. It's a good thing to play around with. And just, you know, if, if someone comes to you and they've got a dispute with, uh, uh, if they know the identity of the person who holds onto the uh, Ethereum wallet, and, and, you know, you you know from just from within two seconds, you can log on to Ethereum or some other uh, blockchain monitoring network. And you can look at that wallet and you can see what's happening to it, where the money's going, where the crypto's going. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a good starting point uh, before you go on to the forensics and, and other matters. I'm just going to add as an anecdote, Rakesh, that I have dealt with a dispute where the arbitration clause specified that the arbitrator must be someone with blockchain experience. It did take right. SIC some time to locate an arbitrator, and there was someone in the UK, eventually from Matt's chambers, actually. Right. So, okay, let's take the next question, which is directed at Matthew. Um, following your thoughts in freezing injunctions, most crypto asset owners are generally anonymous. Can the custodian be a platform be compelled to freeze by an arbitral tribunal and to what extent? Yes. Okay. So uh, that, that that's overlapping a little bit with what Calvin was saying. Uh, so there's, there's two elements here. First is the anonymous side and second is the, the power to freeze. So the anonymous side is, of course, one of the, the sort of traditional uh, I suppose criticisms of of crypto is that it's anonymous. It gives the opportunity for people to try and um, hide from enforcement or hide from um, prosecuting authorities. But for all the reasons that we've already been discussing, such as EtherScan, such as the software that Calvin was talking about, actually the the anonymity side is perhaps overblown. So I think that's an important thing we need to get at. Um, right at the start is not to be concerned if you don't know the actual person yet who 
has the particular crypto asset because there are lots of ways to find it out. Um, one of those which is done quite a lot now in um, in England, there's been a few cases, is getting the uh, crypto exchanges to effectively hand over all the details of their customers. So if you've managed to identify that you've got some Bitcoin in a particular wallet with a particular exchange, it's then a very easy process to go along to the exchange, just like a bank, and say, well, we here's a court order telling us, telling you, tell us all of the information you've got about our customer. So you then can break the anon anonymity down in that sense. The, the second point is one about powers and the ability to freeze. So this is, I suppose, one of the disadvantages of arbitration versus court is the slightly more limited power of the tribunal. It's been done to death in many other contexts, but the tribunal can only make orders as between the parties who've consented to go to arbitration. That's fairly um, arbitration 101. So the question is, can the um, custodian, the platform be compelled to freeze by the tribunal? And the answer is yes, if the platform is a party to the arbitration agreement, and because there the tribunal has power to take steps in relation to the property in the dispute. If, as I suspect is probably the more common situation, the exchange or the platform is not a party to the arbitration agreement, the tribunal's got no power over them, but the courts still do and still can exercise it. So that's your answer. So I, I suppose having taken a fairly roundabout way to get there, the, the short answer to this particular question is if you've got some anonymous holder of cryptocurrency and you want to freeze that cryptocurrency but you don't yet know who the person is, the solution which has been um, picking up some momentum is to essentially start a claim or make a claim against the unknown person, whoever they may be, and you can define them as the person's unknown being the holder of this particular crypto wallet, get a freezing injunction against them in court, and then you give that court order to the exchange. So it's not an order against the exchange, but it's an, it's an order that tells the exchange, this person's assets are frozen. We say that this particular wallet is this person's assets. So it's on you, the exchange. If you now don't freeze that account, then the exchange is taking the risk of, of breaching the court order by facilitating um, the contempt of court. Thank you. I think we have another question that's come in, uh, and this might be our last question given that our session is ending soon. Um, the question is, what is likely to happen if despite a freezing order, there is a smart contract that dissipates assets from a particular wallet? Um, Calvin, would you want to have a go at this? I'll try. I mean, again, anything to do with smart contract, I think it's fascinating. Um, I mean, the, the immediate answer is we'll see and we'll see how that develops. I suppose my immediate thought is, you know, if you can still trace where those assets went, right? So then you will employ some of those tools to try and recover that and try to, you know, it's, it's not a literal unwind, but, but basically try and, and get back to the original position that it should be in uh, using those other tools. I don't know if others have, a, have another view on that. No, I, I think that's, I think that's right. I mean, I think right now it's, um, it's probably easier. Well, I don't, I don't know how to answer this exactly. I was going to say it's easier to trace assets, digital assets right now than it may be as assuming the world adopts a more decentralized, um, kind of philosophy around Bitcoin and these, these crypto assets as like they were originally intended. Right now, it's pretty difficult to, to keep your assets entirely off any sort of centralized exchange, whether you need that to do a transaction back to fiat or to acquire other cryptos or because a party you're transacting with doesn't have their own unhosted wallet, their wallet is with you know, uh, Coinbase or one of the other exchanges. Um, and, you know, until, th until that day isn't around anymore, there's usually, you're often going to be able to find someone to compel to freeze that wallet. Maybe not forever, but for now, it's like, it can be tough. I mean, that's why you hire someone like Calvin to trace this stuff because it's really 
difficult and you have to know what you're doing to do it and be able to operate in a lot of different jurisdictions with great speed to, to try to keep up with this. But it's not, um, it's not futile either. I think the one thing that I would add is that you also have to look at the consequences of breaching the freezing injunction because the smart contract has done what it's done. Um, when someone breaches any court order, uh, you straight away you'll say it's contempt. But there's a, there's obviously elements there of, of you know that they intend to breach the court order, and if they did it, then what's the outcome of that? It'd be quite hard pressed to say that the defendant is in contempt of the of the Bereva injunction, freezing injunction, because. Uh, of something that they agreed to uh, in the form of a smart contract, um, or if they if they signed up to a token that that automatic, automatically executes upon certain conditions being met, um, it, it'd be quite hard pressed to say that they intended to breach the court order in that instance. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. I mean, thank you all for being here. It was an engaging session that's evidenced by the fact that we had a number of questions uh, from the audience members. Um, we probably may not have time to get to all your questions, and you may have questions that you have for our speakers. Um, their bios are available uh, online. You should be able to get their emails. Feel free to reach out to them or to me if you have any questions that you were not able to ask uh, or have answered today. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.